The day is December 13th, 1795. The setting is the village of Wold Newton in Yorkshire, England. It's not a particularly nice day in the village of Wold Newton. It's thundering like crazy. Folks are probably huddling inside as best they can, and very little work is getting done. We're on land that belongs to Major Edward Topham, and he was a deeply eccentric guy. He had multiple children out of wedlock. He had a libel charge. He got into all sorts of trouble. He wrote out a vicious memoir of a then member of parliament called John Ells that some say later was read by Charles Dickens and used as a direct inspiration for Ebenezer Scrooge, though to be fair, that's never been verified. But no matter what, Topham was a deeply polarizing guy while he was alive. And his greatest accidental contribution to culture would arrive today. It's roughly 3 p.m. now. It's still storming like the damned. One of the only people outside right now is a worker on his property called John Shipley. He's been described in what follows as either a plowman or a shepherd, depending on who you ask. It's unclear exactly what John was doing out in the rain that day. And if he was working for Topham, perhaps he was being forced to work in the rain. But what happens next is described by everyone in the area, but especially John, as a loud explosion in the sky. A couple of years later, he is quoted in the then popular gentleman's magazines describing that something struck the ground roughly eight or nine yards away from him. The grass and the dirt blow out in all directions, practically right in his face. Maybe he stood his ground. Maybe he was knocked flat off his feet. John, without knowing it just yet, had just witnessed the landing of the largest meteorite in British history and the second largest in all of Europe. Now, sadly, this is where our knowledge of John and what he did in this story ends. Topham immediately claims the stone as his own, given that it did land on his land. John vanishes entirely from the narrative except where it benefits his benefactor to confirm that he really did see it. Perhaps Topham saw himself as gracious for allowing John even that amount of credit. And Topham does get the date wrong a year later when he's asked to elaborate. He lists the date mistakenly as December 20th, not the 13th, exactly a week after it actually landed. It hit the ground of Wold Newton so hard that it actually goes almost two feet underneath the earth, under several inches of solid rock. And Topham, for his part, doesn't hold on to the meteorite for long. He ends his part in this story by selling it off in 1804 to a naturalist and illustrator called James Sowerby, known for numerous illustrations and books on various plants and rocks across the world, and he gets, for his efforts, a 56-pound shard at rock. Sowerby keeps it for the next 31 years, spends the entire time chipping off samples for his various friends and shrinking it more and more. He's not especially conscientious as an owner. He hands it off to the British Museum in 1835, and there is no modern measurement that I could find for what is left of the rock except a monument in Wool Newton enacted by Topham in 1799 and was left of it living in the Natural History Museum in London. And if you happen to ever be around there, maybe give it a visit for me. The story, as you might expect, does not quite end there. Philip Jose Farmer died on my birthday. To be fair, not the exact day I was born, but my birthday. Farmer wrote a number of science fiction novels until his death in 2009. It's something that he loved, but his true passion was in somewhere a bit more unusual involving his writing. And it is here that our Wool Newton meteorite is going to become relevant to our story again. It's not clear that Farmer ever saw the meteorite in person while he was alive, but at some point, he became absolutely obsessed with it. But we can't list the exact day that Farmer learned about the meteorite for the first time. We can trace his first public reaction to it in 1972, when he published a book that at first glance you wouldn't think would have anything to do with our meteorite. Now, do you think you can guess, without looking at the thumbnail and title, what this could be about? Well, I'll give you a hint. The book was about Tarzan. Yes that Tarzan. Tarzan Alive, a definitive biography of Lord Greystroke, was Farmer's attempt to make as though Tarzan, with the Anglicanized name of John Clayton, was a real-life person, and he could prove it. Now, in all fairness to Farmer, he did not think that Tarzan was literally real. Rather, he wanted to pretend as though he was, and see what a book might look like in a world where he 
really was a historical figure. He imagined the original books by Edgar Rice Burroughs in the same vein as stories about real life people like Davy Crockett or Buffalo Bill, real guys with fictional stories written about them. The detail he gets into trying to predict the movements and life of a real Tarzan if he really existed is incredibly granular. He imagines that Tarzan was born in 1888 in what was then called French Equatorial Africa when it was a part of France's imperialist ambitions in the continent. Farmer, by his own admission, ignores Burroughs' endorsement of colonialist ideologies in his story of a white man who, by his whiteness, becomes the assumed leader of all life that exists in a place he's not really from. Neither Burroughs nor Farmer had ever traveled to the places that they wrote about, and their own distance ignored the realities of those who live there. Nonetheless, he ignores this subtext and imagines an entire lifetime for him based on these stories. He imagines that Jane Porter, his true love, was born two years after him. Every single event and every story by Burroughs and other authors are imagined in the range of 1888 to 1946, after which Tarzan vanishes into the made-up fantasy city of Opar, which Burroughs imagined as a place where apes and humans interbred. The connotations from that narrative choice are obvious. But in this timeline, one huge question remained that Farmer needed to answer. That was the question of how exactly Tarzan developed his supernatural talents to be able to do so easily what other white men couldn't. This is where Farmer hit on his favorite idea, where his obsession began. He imagined that as the Wold Newton meteorite cascaded across the sky in 1795, about to come to an abrupt halt in a small village within Yorkshire, that it cast off radioactive energy, the likes of which had never been seen before. He goes on to theorize in his alternate history that it was not only John Shipley who witnessed the meteorite, but that two carriages were passing by in the torrential rain at the exact same time that it landed. 25 people in total were ultimately present, and though we don't have time to mention all of them, we do have enough time to go over some of the people that Farmer theorized could have witnessed the meteorite and had been affected by it. Two of these were the direct ancestors of Tarzan himself, and that was where everything came together. The mysterious energies emanated by the rock before Edward Topham had it collected affected the biology of these people, giving their descendants strange superhuman abilities. Thus, this is why everything came so easily to Tarzan, according to Farmer. But it wasn't just his ancestors in those carriages. Farmer goes so far as to claim that Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Darcy from Pride and Prejudice and the ancestors of Sherlock Holmes were in those carriages as well. This begins to spin out from there as he begins to write about more characters and more authors become enamored with the idea. He goes next to the pulp character Doc Savage, himself a direct inspiration for Superman, and imagines that his ancestors saw this magical meteorite as well. He imagines that Sherlock Holmes and his nemesis Professor Moriarty are distantly related, each descended from various people in those carriages. Eventually, with those other writers in tow, he imagines family trees that connect Tarzan to the likes of Buffy, Conan the Barbarian, Cthulhu, Doctor Who, I I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I meant the Doctor, I meant the Doctor, I swear to God I meant the Doctor. Godzilla, Indiana Jones, James Bond, the Wizard of Oz, Star Trek characters like Spock, who claims to be a direct descendant of Sherlock Holmes. An ancestor of mine maintained that if you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And James T. Kirk, who is apparently related to Tarzan, and most of the characters from the Marvel and DC universes. All of them, according to Farmer and company, are either distantly related or connected in some way to some story that connects in some way to that meteorite. This expanded still further with the works of Wynne Eckert, the heir apparent to this strange tradition, who moved to connect even more fictional settings and characters to one another, all connected in some way by the same meteorite. What you have now consists of dozens of websites, a horde of books of different authors, predominantly Farmer and Eckert, and hours upon hours of theory by these writers and more. You have fan wikis, you have websites, you have as much as you can imagine. What I'm telling you barely scratches the surface of how deep this fictional iceberg goes. And all of this is anchored to a single meteorite that now sits in the Natural History Museum in London. It's a direct line from 1795 to 1804 to 1835 to 1973 to now. How did we get to here from a single bad thunderstorm one day in December? It's like that thunderstorm created a butterfly effect. John Shipley had a hole blasted right in front of his face and witnessed a history that was nearly taken from his grasp. A stone passed from hand to hand, and one day a writer heard of that stone and was so inspired that he took a classic literary character and connected him with a billion more. 
it has to be noted that this entire endeavor is more of a thought experiment than anything else. And I do have my own personal objections with so many characters being related by blood, which gives off to me a eugenicist vibe at worst. In some ways, it can feel like the world's most benign conspiracy theory. One that can't imagine any one person being great of their own accord, but rather being destined for it by their bloodline and their family from the start. And to me, that feels kind of uncomfy in some ways. I mean, we're reckoning till this day with the harmful tropes and stories, and that blame cannot be fairly put on Farmer or Eckert or the rest for indulging their fantasies. These are characters that have been reinterpreted time and time again as they continue to exist, and many of them come from very reductive or questionable backgrounds. The Tarzan of them is not the Tarzan of now, even if he is best known for the Disney movie with that kick-ass Phil Collins soundtrack. But still, the butterfly effect of it all is the part that still grabs me, in spite of its problematic beginnings. One rock, one crash landing, that's all it took. The Wold Newton universe, as Eckert refers to it, can feel like in some ways the mostly hidden precursor to the franchises calling themselves universes that we have today. The MCU and the DCEU, or whatever James Gunn's version of it will be called, for starters, have such a convoluted lore of its own that it becomes harder and harder to follow along no matter how much of it I like. We live in an age where everything is a game of corporate mandated Wikipedia. Everything is a reference. Everything is a rabbit hole. Everything is homework. Everything is something to remember. Everything is a reference for its own sake. The moral is not things were better back then, because they very much were not. I can hardly imagine the likes of Kevin Feige were ever aware that writers like Farmer and Eckert even existed. But nothing exists in a vacuum, and we can be influenced by things or people we've never even heard of without realizing it. Would it be fair to call the WNU or the WNU or I guess however you call it some great innovation in the realm of storytelling? Ah, eh, not really. It is at best a massive stretch, meant as a fun thought exercise for a lot of very nerdy people, and as a very nerdy person I can hardly judge. If that's the sort of thing that's as fun for you as it can be for me, I invite you to check out the currently existing site. Scroll through for a while, see what you think, decide if it feels worthwhile for you. The fun part is that so many of these characters are those you can write with yourself with no threat of a lawsuit. It's clear that a lot of writers get mileage out of the realm of the public domain where characters are copyright free. You can do whatever you want with Dracula or King Arthur or Robin Hood or really whoever who would be existing before the year 1928. Alan Moore, you know, the guy who made Watchmen, has his League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which has a very similar premise. And I, I gotta warn you, it is a fucking bizarre comic. That comic's version of the Antichrist is literally Harry Potter. I I'm not kidding. And that ends up feeling really prophetic given, you know, her. There's still numerous reimaginings of so many characters to this day, and even when a character doesn't get those, they've influenced someone else you may know more. I mean, you might have never heard of the Scarlet Pimpernel before right now, but you don't get to Batman without him. Today, The Rock sits in the Natural History Museum. Perhaps, one day, if the horrors ever recede enough, I have the money and I can safely travel, and I will visit the museum for myself and look that rock in the eye and do something that neither Burroughs nor Farmer ever got to do. That's a, maybe a harder goal than I want to set for myself, but it feels extremely ambitious during a time where nothing is certain, least of all my future or yours. But it would still be cool to do. I've liked astronomy since I was a little kid. My grandpa would show me the stars in his telescope and let me see the surface of the moon. I don't think I've ever actually seen a meteorite in person, let alone one that supposedly gave Tarzan mutant powers. If you've seen it, or maybe if you live a little bit closer to there than I do, uh, me being in America, maybe take a picture or a video and show it to me. It just goes to show that anything can spark that creative inspiration in you. Anything. You can get from a rock in England to a Pulp Fiction character. Any kind of pattern can be made. There's a bizarre sort of symmetry in that. Tarzan isn't even a character I particularly care about in other instances. I did really like the Disney movie with that kick-ass Phil Collins soundtrack as a kid, though. I didn't really like the one with Margot Robbie in it as much, although that wasn't really her fault. C'est la vie. But that's where we are now. It can come from anywhere. Let your minds wander. Let any particular thing be the kindling that sets the stage for the spark that can light up your imagination. And that, that sounds idealistic, I fully admit to that. A part of me is like laughing and cringing at the idea at the same time. But honestly, you really never know. 
Will it cause world peace, or will it pay your rent on time? Eh, probably not. Still, we're not here for long. Don't ignore that calling when you hear it, because I really want to see what you, yeah, you, create next. See what'll be the meteorite in your Wool Newton. Do it for me, okay? Thank you so much for spending this time with me today talking about something that I hope you can see how much I care about. I hope to see you again soon.